So, good afternoon and thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to introduce our uh, today's speaker. Actually, he is the first speaker of the academic year of 2020-2021. And we are all uh, in Zoom. Uh, we know why. So let's, uh, let me introduce you Dr. Jonathan Belinkov. He joined the Faculty of Computer Science at the Technion last summer. And prior to that, he was a mind, brain, and behavior postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University and a postdoctoral associate at MIT. He earned his PhD in computer science at MIT. Dr. Belinkov conducts research in natural language processing focusing on issues of interpretability and robustness of automatic methods for processing human language. He is an Israeli faculty fellow as well. Uh, Jonathan, you can grab the floor. The floor is, is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Vered, for this nice introduction and for inviting me. I will share the screen, the slides. Okay, um, just a moment. Okay. And so I'm uh, managing two screens here. So hopefully I can also see you on one screen and the slides on another screen. So if, uh, since we are a small group, feel free to interrupt and um, we can try to have some sort of discussion as we go through uh, the, the slides. So this um, work is work that I've done when, while I was at MIT with a number of collaborators. Um, Alexander Megiddo who was uh, one of the driving forces behind this as well as Alberto, um, Avi and uh, Maxim Romanov. And we uh, were trying to study the history of the Arabic language using language technology and um, building on a large scale historical corpus that was uh, compiled uh, by Maxim Romanov and, and some other uh, people. Uh, so I'll start with some background on, on Arabic and one of the main features of, uh, of the Arabic language is the status of so-called diglossia, which means that we have, uh, in fact, two varieties of, um, of Arabic, or two main varieties. Uh, one is the standard language, and the other one is the spoken language. And they coexist and have been coexisting for, for quite a long time. Uh, now, the language has been uh, it's commonly said that it's been standardized very early on uh, in somewhere along the 18th, uh, 8th uh, century, uh, maybe even uh, before that. And um, this is work that has been done by various uh, Arab grammarians uh, from that time on into medieval uh, times. Uh, and, and they took a lot of care on, of uh, describing the language, um, the rule system and uh, standardizing it. Uh, there are also a number of non-standard varieties. Um, of course, the spoken Arabic, which I've already uh, mentioned, as well as Middle Arabic and Judeo Arabic and various other forms. Uh, they are very valuable uh, for linguists uh, and historical linguists because, for example, these uh, uh, non-standard varieties um, um, maintains various features that are lost from the standard language. So it, it's useful to look at them, but we don't have many uh, resources or not as many resources as we have uh, for the, sta the standard language. And even when we do have those resources, they probably have gone through various editing procedures and processes. Uh, Sorry about the background noise. Um, okay, so uh, in this work, we focus on the standard um, standard Arabic. So, so that's the first thing to, to note. 
Now, uh, there are uh, typically uh, uh, the history of the standard Arabic is divided into two main eras or two main periods. One is the classical Arabic and the other one is the modern standard Arabic or also known as MSA. So classical Arabic is commonly, we're commonly told it's from around the beginning of the, uh, um, of Islam. Uh, so seventh uh, century uh, up until 18th or 19th uh, century. And uh, modern standard Arabic is from that time to, uh, to our days. So a typical division is the so-called division. If you are familiar with um, the Arabic terms, then the classical, classical Arabic is sometimes called um, um, Fusha and, uh, and modern standard Arabic. Well, uh, according to several people, they're not, there's not much difference, but uh, research has it that there is a difference. So this is what we know, or we think we know about the division from linguistics. And that's the main thing that, uh, that we know about the history of the language. Uh, of course, there are more uh, potential periods and more studies. So uh, classical Arabic, although we, many people consider it fossilized and fixed, uh, there are some studies that try to divide it into sub periods. Uh, so this study by Fisher uh, talks about three parts of or three, three periods in classical Arabic, the pre-standardized classical Arabic, the standardized one and the post classical Arabic. And then we still have the modern uh, standard Arabic. So pre-standardized is perhaps the language of poetry, and uh, very early writings, uh, inscriptions, or maybe other early writings, er early forms of the Quran, for example. Standardized uh, is the main bulk or, or what we have most, and then post-classical Arabic is more medieval times. So one division uh, is by Fisher, and then there's another division by Ali uh, that doesn't exactly talk about periods, but uh, he talks about uh, waves or Renaissance, uh, Renaissance waves. So here, um, the main historical events are the rise of the Abbasid Empire in 750 and the fall of the Abbasid Empire in uh, the mid 13th century. So the, the first Renaissance is during this period of the, the Abbasid uh, Empire, which is followed by a decline. Uh, a decline in the language, a decline in uh, productivity. Uh, and uh, then later on in modern times, there is a second Renaissance, which coincides with uh, the, the broad division of modern standard Arabic. So that is the period where we have um, uh, news uh, outlets, we have technological advances, we have more contact with um, uh, Europe. Uh, and the West, and, and so the language has to accommodate and change, and there's a renaissance of language use. Okay, so two, uh, two divisions. This is the two subdivisions, I would say. This is the second one. Uh, so how do these two models uh, differ? Uh, according to the first one I showed, the Fisher's model, the standardized form of classical Arabic starts very early. And then uh, he views post-classical Arabic as a development of the language. Uh, in contrast, according to uh, Ali's uh, model, there are significant changes during the Abbasid period, so this period of the first uh, Renaissance. And um, to him, the post-classical Arabic is the end of the Renaissance and there's not much change or not much growth uh, going on in that period. Okay, so what are the questions here uh, in this work? Uh, the first question is, um, is formal written Arabic unchanging and homogeneous, or can we actually divide it into separate uh, periods? So the, the common knowledge, or uh, mo according to most people, is that the formal language, uh, formal written Arabic is, is not, is relatively unchanged. So it's been kind of the, it's been standardized early on and it's remained uh, sort of in its state 
uh, for throughout this time. Although I've shown you that there are some people who suggest some subdivisions, but the, in, in some sense, this is a minority. So according to most people, we know that there's a classical Arabic and modern standard Arabic, but in classical Arabic, there's not much change. Um, so can we actually divide it or find some periods uh, in, the, uh, in the history of the, of the language? And what uh, computational tools and resources do we need to answer these questions? Uh, now, we, we will, at, at least we want to make sure or verify findings against previously proposed periodizations, the ones that I've mentioned, and perhaps even find uh, new periodizations. Uh, so here's the outline for the, the talk. First, I'll describe uh, OpenITI, which is a corpus um, of historical uh, Arabic texts. Uh, that has been uh, developed uh, prior to this work and independently, but we, we've made extensive use and uh, processed it in, in various ways. Uh, then uh, the two main uh, technological issues will be how to identify instances of text reuse. So things like quotes um, and paraphrases and, uh, and reuse text from between different documents. And uh, the second issue is an algorithm for automatic periodization uh, of the language. And finally, uh, we'll go through a few other statistics about the, uh, the lifespan of a word. So how long do words uh, remain in use and how new words are formed over time. And we'll also look at uh, some expert uh, linguistic periodizations and whether we, the data yields or supports them. So are there any questions before, uh, before I move on? I have a small question. Sorry. Jonathan. Yes. Uh, what was uh, fascinating in Arabic that you chose this as a subject to research? Uh, what was fascinating in Arabic? Uh, OK, I think there are two ways to answer. Personally, I've I've been fascinated by this language for a very long time. So uh, I think it's, very, it's a very interesting language. Um, one reason is the diglossia. So the fact you have the spoken and the, the standard language that are very different and that uh, is a source of all sorts of problems, but also interesting phenomena. It's, uh, it's also a kind of macro language. So there are actually multiple dialects and varieties and they all differ and they have some similarities and differences. So I think it's very interesting to study. Uh, in my master's uh, thesis, I actually recorded uh, people speaking um, a certain dialect in Jisr Azarka, which is a village in Israel for those who don't know, and analyze their language, which I think is an interesting dialect. But um, also more broadly, uh, it, it, Arabic is, speci is special in the sense that it has a very long period of written um, uh, life of this language. So we have documents from 1400 uh, years ago. So we don't have, there are not many languages that have that. We have even older documents uh, written in Hebrew, biblical documents and so on, but Hebrew has not been in very active uh, use during the, throughout this whole time. It had periods of very little use, whereas Arabic has been in very active use for a very long time. So I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting language to study. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, talk about the corpus or the collection of texts. This is uh, open ITI, it's the Open Islamicate Text Initiative, which is a, a collection of a bunch of texts that are taken from various uh, editions of books that are found online um, that are freely available. So people uh, just, most of them were just uh, typed by volunteers, so people type them uh, and, uh, and publish them on, online. Uh, it mostly has religious uh, texts and uh, literary uh, texts, so that is a kind of 
there's a specific uh, genre that is uh, contained and covered in this corpus, so not everything is there. And there are a few metadata. So for every document, we know its uh, title, we know the author name, and we know the date of death, of death of the author. So we have some timing information, some date information, but it's not very, very, very fine-grained. We, we don't know exactly when the document was written, but we know who wrote it and when that person died. So we can get a rough idea of when uh, the document was written. Uh, the corpus has uh, two versions, the full and the core. Uh, the core removes a bunch of noise and, and duplicates and things like that. And, and so for the most part, we use the core version. Um, and I should acknowledge uh, Maxim Romanov and his team for doing a, a massive amount of work on collecting this, this corpus uh, from various sources, cleaning the, the data and pre-processing it, preparing it with all the metadata information. And it's all freely available online. So that's, that's a very nice contribution. Uh, here are some uh, statistics. So uh, we're showing here a histogram of uh, counts of how many texts uh, are found uh, in each peer time period. That's on the left. And on the right, how many words we have in each time period. Now the numbers don't exactly, don't really matter for now. What uh, matters is that you can see it's not balanced. So over different, on the x-axis, there are the different time periods. You move from left to right, it's from older times to modern times. And each time period has the number of texts on the left or the number of words on the right. And it's not a balanced um, distribution over time. So there are some time periods where we have much more, we have many more documents and, and, and many more uh, words than, than other time periods. Um, these time periods kind of make sense in historically because sometimes in the period of the Abbasid Empire, for example, where there were a lot of translations uh, in libraries, uh, uh, we have a lot of documents. And later we have some fewer documents. And then in the modern period, well, in the modern period, we actually don't have many documents and many words. It's not that there are no documents. Of course, there are many texts written in the modern period. But remember that the corpus focuses on uh, religious texts, and th those come more from earlier uh, times. Uh, so given this uh, data set or this corpus, we uh, applied a bunch of tools for natural language processing, so automatic methods for processing human language, including splitting the text into sentences, uh, which is not a trivial problem, by the way, uh, uh, performing morphological segmentation, so saying for every word, what are the sub components or the, the morphemes of the, of the word. Lemmatization, which means for every word, finding a canonical um, item, a dictionary item. And uh, part of speech tagging, which means for every word, uh, we have the part of speech of that word that is a property like saying, is this word a noun, a verb, an adjective, and so on. And finally, syntactic parsing. So we, uh, we have a, a, a structure, a syntax structure of uh, every sentence. Uh, the pre-processing is mostly based on a tool called the uh, Farasa. And that's a tool that's also available. So if someone wants to apply uh, these techniques on, uh, on, on Arabic, then um, you can use this tool. Uh, it was designed to deal with, deal with modern standard Arabic and not necessarily with older texts. So I, I'll remind you that we, are, we have a long time span, including a lot, many, many documents from classical Arabic. And in fact, the majority of the documents are not from the modern period. And so it's possible that this tool, uh, Farasa, doesn't work very well. We performed a small manual evaluation, just looked at uh, about uh, 500 words, and we actually found it to perform quite well. So it has very good accuracy in, in the properties that we have uh, we've, uh, uh, evaluated. Uh, this table shows uh, an example of uh, the different features that we have now, or the different pro processing that we have applied. 
So the top two is the plain text. If you read Arabic, then you, you, you can identify it. You can know what it means. Anusach um, and But if you don't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter for now. Uh, what I just want to show is that segmentation is a way to split a word into some uh, strings, some uh, parts. The plus sign is a delimiter that uh, separates different components uh, of the word. Lemmatization is the process of getting a canonical form. So we get rid of some things like prefixes and suffixes that are not part of the dictionary item. And uh, part of speech tagging is to say that one word is a noun, the other one is an adjective. There's a gloss here. So if you don't know how to read Arabic, then this just means the handwritten copies. Uh, and, um, and that's it. OK. So all these, all these procedures are pretty important for Arabic because it's a language with a rich morphology. So uh, there are many uh, ways to express a very similar meaning. So verbs conjugate uh, for many forms, and uh, noun declensions are also uh, complicated. Uh, and so it's important to apply these pre-processing steps to make sure we capture what we want to capture. We want to treat different slightly different variants of a word, we, we don't necessarily want to separate them if they have uh, similar meanings, for example, or the same meaning. OK. Uh, there's another example here that just shows this uh, segmentation and lemmatization. Uh, I think we can skip this. Uh, so we have this corpus and we pre-processed it, uh, apply these uh, natural language processing tools. And the main issue we, the first main issue we had to deal with is text reuse. Um, it turns out that there in this, this uh, data set, there are many, many quotations and paraphrases. So uh, some works and documents quote or paraphrase earlier works. Um, and documents. Now, when we try to conduct an historical analysis, this is especially important to, to take into account because we are interested in questions like how the language um, evolves over time or changes and are there different parts. And so whether or not um, people cite or use uh, language from earlier times can impact this analysis. So. For instance, we might want to distinguish between original language use and, quote, and quotations and paraphrases. Maybe original language use represents better the, the language of the, the author uh, rather than uh, quoting some text that has some document that has appeared uh, centuries ago. Uh, so we adapted uh, an existing algorithm for identifying text reuse that was developed for the Talmud uh, by Avi Schmidman, who is one of my co-authors, as well as uh, Koppel and Poat. Uh, they ran this, uh, this original algorithm was developed for Hebrew and for the Talmud, and they actually ran it to identify all the matches um, or text reuse uh, instances in, in the Talmud. Uh, here we adapted it for this uh, corpus of historical Arabic, and what we end up with is uh, quite a lot of text reuse, uh, specifically uh, 292 million of reused words. So out of the corpus of something like 1 billion words, or, um, maybe a third uh, reused words. And we distinguish those to uh, boilerplate fragments and approximate matches. Boilerplate fragments are things that are relatively short and are, or are cited as is. And they, re they are repeated many, many, many times. Um, there are 230,000 such fragments. So these are things, uh, mainly uh, passages from the, uh, or verses from the Quran, or passages from the Hadith, um, the oral tradition. Uh, and Hadith is like the Toshba, for those who, who don't know it. And, um, and Quran, well, that's known. And also various religious formulae. Um, so we first identify those boilerplate fragments. Uh, those are maybe interesting to study, uh, but they te technically it's pretty easy to identify them because they are literally exact matches of, um, uh, of strings. 
and uh, of, of text. Uh, and then next, we identified uh, approximate matches. Uh, and approximate matches have, I'll show an example in a little bit, so those might be longer. And it, it, it may not be that every word is exactly the same as the source, but there, there are many, um, many parallels in the approximate matches. Okay, so let's see examples. This is what we call a boilerplate fragment. So this is an example that appears literally as it is many, many times in the corpus. And uh, I'm not gonna read uh, the example now, but um, if you read either the Arabic or the English, you, you will see that it talks about someone telling someone else, telling someone else, telling someone else, and so on. So this is known as a chain of transmission uh, that's used in the Hadith or the, the old tradition uh, for uh, given narrating or given um, credible sources for uh, certain stories. Uh, so um, this is also found in, um, um, in Jewish sources. Uh, so th those appear many, many times, but they might not be super interesting for us when we try to study periodization. Still, it may be useful in one of our historic Alex, who is a historical uh, linguist, is actually quite interested in them. Uh, so that's a, bo a boilerplate because they, it just repeats many, many times exactly as it is. Uh, more, perhaps more interesting and definitely more challenging is the approximate matches. So here I'm showing a, a source or an original text and a reused version of that. And in red, are the parts that changed. So you can see most of the text, uh, most of this uh, sentence actually stays the same. It's in, in black, uh, but a few words uh, change and it's really like a, a minor paraphrase, um, but still it, it's quite clear that this is a, a reused example, a paraphrase or a quote, if you will, an approximate quote. So uh, we would like to identify those and the, <clears throat> the text BIOS algorithm that we use can identify these uh, approximate matches. Okay. Um, so the, uh, any questions before I move on to the periodization work? Okay, so um, <clears throat> our, our main task is this automatic periodization and uh, what do we have? The available data that we have is uh, texts or documents with their dates, where dates are the uh, date, of their, uh, date of death of the author. So it's not a very accurate date of when the text was written, but it's an approximate um, date. And what we want, we want an automatic division of the language into time periods. So the main observation here is that uh, language in two consecutive time periods should be more similar than language in two remote time periods. So the language, language may change, but it changes in a gradual way and perhaps a consistent way. So uh, the language spoken um, nowadays is probably similar to the language spoken 50 years ago, or at least it's more similar to the language spoken 50 years ago than to the language spoken 500 years ago. So close time periods should have language use that is more similar than far away time periods. And the way we build on this observation is uh, using an, uh, an automatic algorithm for periodization. And the, the key idea is the following. We start by dividing the, lang the, um, the time span into many uh, time periods. And then we merge the two most similar time periods that are consecutive. So we look for every uh, two consecutive time periods and we merge the two most similar ones. And then we merge the next two most similar time periods and so on. Well, let me show you an example to make this uh, clear. So imagine that this is a, an illustration, okay? So imagine that we have 10 uh, time periods. Maybe each time period is something like a century, so 100 years. 
and uh, 100 years of language use. And for each time period, we have all the documents that were written in that time period. So we start with the, those 10 time periods and we look at the first two and we ask how similar they are. Uh, and then we look at the, the, the next two and ask how similar they are and how similar the, the next two are and so on. Um, and uh, we, have, we need to have some way to uh, decide how similar two time periods are, which I will uh, explain in a little bit. But for now, uh, trust me that we have uh, some way to say how similar two time periods are, okay? So perhaps we found that the most similar um, two time periods are number seven and eight, okay? So uh, given this, we merge them. So we, have, we now have a new time period, the time period corresponding to what used to be seven and eight, and the rest of the periods are still the same. And uh, we know we can ask how similar they are, and we can also ask how similar the new time period is, this merged seven, eight period, to uh, what comes before it and what comes after it. So again, we ask how similar it is, and maybe we found that this time the most similar pair was the seven eighth time period and the time period nine. Uh, so we merged that, and now we have a seven eight nine time period. And we, again, we'll ask how similar that is to the next time period and to what comes before that. And maybe it's most similar to uh, time period 10, so we merge this, and so on. We ask how similar that is. Maybe now we found that the most similar is time period, time periods three and four, so we merge that. We ask how similar the merged one is to the, uh, to the, the other ones, and we continue. So I'll just go through this. We find another one that's most similar, and now we have time period one, two, three, four. We ask how similar that is. Now we find that five and six are the most similar, and um, we ask how similar that is to the, the merged ones. And finally, we, we end up with this uh, tree structure, uh, also known as a dendrogram, okay? So that's showing us uh, w which are the most similar time periods at each point in time and, and how we've merged all of them. And perhaps we don't really care about this process, so I've removed some information. But, but now we have this dendrogram or this uh, tree structure over all the original time periods. Okay, so uh, what does that tell us? Uh, it, well, given this dendrogram, uh, the structure, we can uh, identify certain structure uh, or certain groups in, the, in all the time periods. For instance, you may see that there are actually two broad groups or clusters of time periods. The, 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 the first four time periods on the left are merged together first. The, all the rest are merged separately, and uh, only after these two are merged independently, then everything is merged together. Or in other words, uh, time periods one, two, three, four are more similar to one another than to the time periods five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay? So that's a way to show us um, uh, periods or uh, groups uh, of periods. Uh, we can even look at the finer grain resolution. So here we actually see that five, six are very uh, similar, but seven, eight, nine, ten are grouped separately, and only then we have five, six uh, grouped with seven, eight, nine, ten. So maybe there are three time periods, depending on how low resolution, how um, how low do we want to look, or at at, how, at, at which resolution we want to examine this. So is that uh, clear? Uh, be, um, because next I'm going to say what is similar. I, I didn't define it, but first I want to make sure we understand the algorithm of merging and coming up with this periodization. I see some nods. Maybe just a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering the similarity of, let's say, in this example that you gave between um, eight and nine, and two and three. From this dendrogram, it looks like it's the same um, level of or degree of similarity. 
but actually in in the way that you showed it it's actually not as similar right because it only appeared later shouldn't it, shouldn't it have been higher in the like yeah. the connecting line yeah uh that's true i mean the 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 height of the lines uh, in this it's uh, is not indicative of the actual number so this is more of an illustration here okay we, but but there are dendrograms where they are informative right yes 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 uh, okay. absolutely and in fact okay, in the ones that i will show in the results they are informative mm -hmm. Uh, cool. So here it's more like a, a sketch or an illustration. So what matters is what is what is grouped with what, and not ne not necessarily how high mm -hmm. or low the the lines are. Yeah, that's a good point. We have we have one more question for Greg. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, just uh, for sake of cl clarity, I'm not sure if I missed a point um, about the criteria for similarity. I mean, you, you pointed out that you um, have, you know, the sentence between morphological segmentation, lemmatization, POS tagging, and so on, and syntactic parsing. But, so what exactly are the criteria for, uh, for similarity and do you quantify them in any way? Yeah, okay. So the, the next slide is about uh, how, we, how we define similarity, how we measure similarity. Okay. <laughs> so so I, I will come to that, yeah. Okay, so let's let's yeah let's move on to that. that so that that's the point. Uh, how do we measure similarity? Uh, so the key idea is uh, to get some geometric interpretation of words. Where uh, by geometric, what I mean is that similar words in terms of meaning are just close to one another when we place them on some uh, some space. Or in this case, uh, I'm giving an example of a bunch of words. Uh, and you can notice that some words are similar in their meaning and they're also close together, just when you look at them on the screen. So the words on the left, the words dog, cat, and bird, you know, they're all animals uh, and they are close together. The words uh, Friday and Tuesday are close together. They are all, um, they, they are the, the days of the week and uh, we have various words that relate to walking and running and jogging and they are also all close together. So I, I highlighted them in, in these circles just to, to show. But in fact, what we have is this. We, we don't have those circles. But these are known as word embeddings. This is just some fancy way to say it's a geometric representation of words where you can, you can plot them um, on the screen. In uh, mathematically, um, uh, the, this, uh, these are uh, vectors, if you know them, high dimensional. So they are not just in 2D as we see here on the screen, but they are maybe uh, in a 100 dimensional space or 300 dimensional space. But the, the key idea is, is to rely on these words, uh, on these word representations or, or word embeddings where similar words in terms of meaning are close to one another in terms of geometry. Now, uh, I will show what we do with them. Um, oh, before that, uh, yeah, so, uh, and the way we get those word embeddings is we just use a bunch of uh, texts and there are all sorts of techniques to get those uh, word embeddings from natural language processing that actually I'm not gonna go into, uh, but we can talk about them later if you want. But uh, for now we can, uh, assume that uh, we have given a, a, a lot of uh, documents, a lot of texts, we have some technique to get those uh, word embeddings. Uh, so how do these help and how do we define similarity? Uh, so the idea uh, that we had is to map word embeddings from one time period to another and then me measure how difficult it is to find such a mapping. Intuitively, if it's difficult to map those word embeddings from one time period to another, then the two time periods are not very similar. If it's easy to map, then the two time periods are more similar. Let me show you an illustration of this. So imagine we have two time periods, time period A and time period B, and uh, each time period has uh, word embeddings. So we applied our technique to get um, those geometric interpretations of, uh, of words and we are showing them here. Now, you will notice that some uh, of these are the words we found we had yet, uh, before, and 
uh, I've colored the groups that uh, match between those two time periods. So in red, we have the group of the animals uh, in time period A and time period B. In green, the group of uh, names of, uh, of the days of the week. And in blue, uh, those words that relate to walking and, and running. Now, some uh, words are not shared in the time periods because perhaps the word runner, for example, it's only used in texts from time period A, but not in text from time period B. And the word rush uh, is only used in time period B, but not in time period A. So we will just ignore these words for simplicity. Now, um, can I ask something? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, when you say map word embeddings from one period to another, do you mean map the geometry or actually take the word bird and match it to the word bird? Yeah, very good question. So what I mean is uh, map the geometry. So we know that, or we assume that the word bird is the word bird. Uh, it's just the same word, but it's used in different time periods in different so, ways. So, and so. so so the, the words stay, the, you're still keeping the same points to the same points. You're not check, checking whether there's another word that could correspond to the same place or no. position as bird. Right. Uh, what I do is, maybe I can show an illustration of this. I, uh, oh yeah, we ignore those words. And what I do is I check how to um, move or rotate this such that some group, one group is mapped to another group. So Mathematically, uh, this is um, uh, each time period is represented by some uh, matrix of these word embeddings, and we can rotate this matrix such that the words are mapped onto the, the same words, but in a different time period. So it's, um, we're trying to change the geometry of one time period to match the geometry of a different time period based on the same words that are shared in the time periods. And by map, by changing the geometries, it's, it's not going to be perfect. So you can't map them exactly. But if it's difficult to map, we say that is because there is low similarity in the time periods. If it's easy to find this mapping, then we say it's because there's high similarity between the time periods. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, and so we map, this mapping is meant to um, uh, align the word embeddings from one time period to another time period. Of course, the alignment is not going to be perfect. You, you can see already in those circles that I've drawn that it's not perfect. They kind of, there's a small mismatch. And if the alignment is uh, is very good, then that means that there is a high similarity. If it's not so good, it means there is a low similarity. And can I ask a question, Jonathan? Yes. Regarding the, the leftovers, the purple uh, arrows, uh, right. these are quite important for, for the similarity or not similarity, aren't they? They could be. They, they could be important. We haven't really considered how they impact the, this. So we kind of just threw, the, threw, threw them away uh, to make this simpler. Yeah. OK. But I agreed. It, it, it could have an impact. And you know, one could uh, simulate a test to imagine that some of them are not there, and then uh, throw, throw away some words and repeat this procedure and see what happens. And is it? robust to throwing away words or, or not. But we haven't really done any of that. Thank okay, you. so uh, this procedure gives us a measure of similarity um, that we then plug into the automatic periodization period uh, uh, algorithm, uh, this. So we ask how similar, uh, by how similar what I mean is, suppose we have word embeddings from the two from two time periods, and we do the mapping, and we measure how far we are from the correct one, so we, how bad or good the mapping is, and that's how similar we think the two time periods are. Okay. All right. 
So uh, let's see some results. So this is a result of the um, uh, automatic periodization algorithm on uh, our corpus. And uh, here on the x-axis are the, the years. So we start with centuries. They are numbered by the Islamic calendar, which is why they end up at 1450 and not at 2000. Um, and this is just a, a, a more natural way to, uh, to go with because the, the documents in this corpus are dated by the Islamic calendar. And so we maintain this. Uh, and uh, you can find some structure here. So it looks like there are three main periods. The first two periods on the left, this 200 and 300, um, are combined uh, separately and much later than other time periods. So uh, we have in the middle some chunk, and we have at the very end another uh, group of the very, um, uh, the two final uh, time periods. So one could call them early, middle, and late uh, periods that we, we find. It, it seems like the early period is similar to uh, Fisher's um, division. In Fisher's division, there's a pre-standardized classical Arabic. And uh, perhaps the late period is similar to the modern standard Arabic that I mentioned. Although it's not exactly what we expect from uh, the linguistic literature where the modern standard Arabic uh, period is said to have started earlier, even around um, 1300 or, two, or um, 1250 or something like that. Uh, so it seems to be similar, but not exactly uh, the same. Uh, now I should note that uh, there are obviously some effects that we don't take into account. For example, when we looked at the early, very early texts uh, in that early cluster, we saw a lot of poetry. And, and poetry is by, by virtue of, of poetry is, is a very different kind of language uh, than other kinds of language. So we actually don't disentangle aspects of genre from this analysis. So this analysis includes uh, differences in drama. Okay, so that's the main uh, uh, result. And uh, next, we would like to see what's the effect of text reuse. Uh, I've mentioned before that reusing text could impact periodization. So what we did is we took the text reuse detection results and we removed all the instance, instances of reuse text. That means that if we found that a text has been reused several times, we only keep the earliest time it appears in the corpus and we throw out everything else. Um, assuming that everything else is just reusing the earlier uh, time point. So we get some unreused uh, text, uh, unreused corpus. And what does that look like? Uh, this is the, the periodization without um, uh, reuse. And what we can see here is, uh, more sub-periods in the, well, first there is some, perhaps a clearer separation of early and late uh, periods uh, than before, and even a, a further subdivision inside the classical Arabic period. So I'm showing here, there seems to be this group between 500 and 800, um, and uh, another group between 900 and 1300. Uh, this, perhaps corresponds to uh, the Abbasid Empire. Uh, so the Abbasid Empire uh, appear, uh, rule ends around uh, the 800. And so perhaps um, the first, uh, this sub period is roughly in the, when the re Renaissance of the Abbasid Empire ends and there's a decline. This was suggested by Ali, uh, that I've mentioned uh, earlier. The next time period, uh, the next subdivision that we see here, perhaps also corresponds to uh, something like um, the end of the Muslim control in uh, Spain or the Iberian Peninsula uh, that was in 900 or 1492 uh, CE, and here the beginning or the rise of the Ottoman Empire. So those are suggestions for historic parallels 
for what we might be for why we might be seeing um, these divisions. So the first of them was suggested by Ali, but the second we haven't exactly seen something like that. Uh, we also considered some effect of uh, our pre-processing steps. So far what I've shown you is what happens when you apply the periodization just to plain text, potentially after removing reused uh, elements. Uh, but um, I've mentioned that we've applied various kinds of uh, pre-processing. One thing we did is lemmatize. So lemmatizing uh, removes differences between um, different ways to express the same meaning. Uh, and so to give an English example, uh, the words walk, walks, walked, uh, may all have the same lemma of walk, okay, which is a dictionary item of what it means to walk. And, and so you get rid of uh, variation, morphological um, variations. Uh, so this uh, dendrogram shows the periodization result when we run it on a lemmatized text. So now we, should, we shouldn't have differences from um, different ways to different morphological uh, features. And it looks like there are perhaps, oops, sorry, there are perhaps less clear uh, subdivisions when we look at the lemmatized uh, text. There is still this uh, very uh, late or modern uh, period and very early perhaps, but in between, we don't see a lot of uh, clear clusters or chunks forming. So we don't know exactly why this is the case, but it's possible that the lemmatization removes some differences uh, between the time periods. So maybe the differences are, um, are manifested in morphological properties and not so much in um, lexical properties. But this is, uh, I would say, still an open question. Okay, so this is the end of the automatic periodization uh, part. And next I will talk about some other uh, statistical analyses that, that we've done, but uh, we can also stop for questions if there are any. May I? Yes. Uh, I think this is actually fascinating find the, the, the way it doesn't work with the, with the lemmatization because in a way, maybe um, the what you call lexical properties are not necessarily a feature of the language, but maybe of the content. So it could be that the story here is that it is theological, or I don't know, because these are religious um, uh, religious texts, and and the language actually is is mainly in in the in these morphological um, features and the. This, this uh, also corresponds with something else. I'm, I'm thinking about modern Arabic and modern press, which would be a great focus for for doing dendrograms like this. But and there's some work that I know in English that uh, did the same. But what it showed is actually different discourses, like post-war, pre-war, which didn't necessarily correspond with any linguistic change. So, so I'm just wondering if if you have any thought about this, like the way this is a linguistic or discursive or thematic uh, development. Right, yeah, this is, this is a, a great point. So in fact, um, we don't distinguish between content or discourse or more linguistic -y features and uh, they are all sort of entangled uh, and, and mixed. And this lemmatization does a bit of that, that's true. Um, but yes, I, I assume that there are, there are, there's influence of domain and, and genre and content and discourse and things like that, that we don't really, we don't really separate from the more linguistic features. Uh, so I think it can be done. This lemmatization is one thing. Uh, you could also, so, so what this does is tries to perhaps remove some of the linguistic features and then repeat, you could, do the, you could go the other way around. You could take our periodization algorithm and run it not on uh, word embeddings or uh, word embeddings, which are, but they are lexically, they are lexical mostly, but you can, you can run a periodization algorithm on morphological features or 
syntactic features or even perhaps phonological features we, we don't have we don't really have them but you could perhaps infer them or if you do you could run them uh, these are the kind of things that Avi Schmidman lo loves doing so I guess <laughs> if anything it, it would be his work like you know yeah ab abstracting I, language from right mm -hmm. you 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 could you could do that yeah I imagine this can be done we we haven't looked at, into it in very detail but I, I agree yeah I agree it's a, it's a very important question Jonathan is a lemmatization yeah. lemmatization process um, also um, breaks boundaries between part of speech uh, like walks walking uh, uh, should be all only verbs or does it emerge also verbs and adverbs? No, it keeps them separated. It, it doesn't merge them. So uh, um, another way to say it is that it's only taking into account inflectional morphology and not derivational morphology. Okay, that's a question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. If yes. I, may, I, I would like to ask two questions. Um, about uh, about what we we did today uh, until until now. Uh, one question would be: um, Did you um, uh, did you simply use the periodization following the Hijri years because this is the me metadata that was uh, easily available, or did you also consider um, exploring the results that you would have if you would try to find uh, other uh, time periods, time classes, because nothing says that the, um, that the evolution of the language is um, is something that goes century by century. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be, it could well be interesting to check with fifty years uh, yeah. periods, or right. even uh, if if you can somehow calculate this um, with unequal periods. Um, yeah. So the metadata we have is the Hijri years, uh, but we actually have accurate Hijri years, not the level of uh, centuries, but th those refer to the author date of death and not necessarily to the, the time the, the, the book or the document was written. So I don't really trust them at a very fine grain resolution. We did repeat this analysis on a 50 year uh, time based time period and the results are pretty similar. Uh, changing ver variable Time spans, this is perhaps more complicated and I'll, I'll have to think about it. Yeah. Thank you okay. very much. All right, so uh, the can last... I, sorry, can I just butt in with a very short technical question? Um, yeah. Is the, the analyzed text, is it uh, the, like the... Uh, the um, results of the of the analysis, the um, lemmatization, is this available somewhere? Maybe on yes. the oh, yeah yeah it's available. Yeah, great. We've made yeah we've made the whole pre-processed corpus available with the lemmatization, part of speech tagging, syntactic parsing, and maybe also segmentation. I think so. Great. If you can share share here the the link, I'll be really sure. grateful. Yeah, uh, if I forget, then please remind me. It's, so, it's, also on the, uh, it's also on the paper, I think, but I can definitely share it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so let's move on. Um, a few other an statistical analyses uh, that we've run. One is to look at the lifespan of, of Arabic words. So this is meant to test this um, uh, hypothesis that uh, standard Arabic is not changing much, uh, which is kind of like a common wisdom. And uh, what we want, what we did is measure uh, the word, a word lifespan. So how long is the word in use? That means we just measure the time spent between the first time the word occurs uh, in the corpus and the last time a word uh, occurs in the corpus. And that's called the, the lifespan of one word. And then we uh, count how many words occur uh, each, uh, 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 we count how many words are found in each time span. So this is, these histo histograms that I'm showing here 
are showing those counts. On the x-axis, in both of them, there are the lifespan uh, in years, and on the y-axis are the counts. On the left side is the Arabic version, on the right side is an English version. This is the corpus of historical, Ameri uh, historical American English, I believe. And, um, well, you can see that the average lifespan in Arabic is uh, 12, uh, you know, 1,190 years. The average lifespan in, in, this, uh, in English is 88 years, but this doesn't tell us a lot by itself because this is just a feature of the corpus. The, the corpus in Arabic covers a much longer time span and the, this corpus of historical American English, by design, it only has 200 years. So that, the, this number doesn't mean much. What means more is the shape of the, um, of the plots and the statistic that um, uh, the average lifespan uh, in, in Arabic is 83% of the entire time span of the corpus, while the average lifespan in English is only 45% of the full time span. Or oh, in more detail, what you can see here is that in Arabic on the left side, most words are alive or have a very long time span. Uh, so there are very high bars on the right hand side of the plot. This is here. That means that most words have uh, a long time span. And in English, it's pretty much all over the place. So yes, many words have long time spans, but many words are also short-lived and don't have very long time spans. So in this sense, uh, yes, it looks like standard Arabic is uh, relatively unchanging or it changes less than, uh, than English. Um, kind of similar to that is to count how many words, uh, how many new words are introduced uh, appear over time. So there's some claim that modern standard Arabic introduced many new words. And intuitively, it would make sense if you think of modern standard Arabic, that's from the last 200 years or so. Uh, there have been a lot of technological advances, um, social changes in the Arabic speaking world and so on. So perhaps the modern era should have brought new words. Is that correct? Uh, here is a plot showing uh, how many new words are added as a percentage of the total words. And here we work with uh, lemmas. Uh, so we start from the beginning of the corpus from the, on the left and we move to the end of the, the time span on the right. So when we reach the end, we've covered all the words, that means a fraction of words that we've seen is one because we've seen all the words. Uh, and what we see here is that early on, there are a lot of new words introduced. That is kind of by design. You look at more and more texts, you see more and more words. The interesting uh, points come when you zoom in on some, um, some parts. It's a little hard to see here, so I'm actually going to zoom in. So this is a zoom in on the, uh, the end of the, of the graph, the modern period. So looking from 1700 to 2000. And what we see here is that there is this jump here in the nine, uh, nine, 1900s or so. Uh, this, this kind of rapid increase in the 20th uh, century. So that could correspond to uh, this idea that modern standard Arabic introduced a lot of new words um, because of the, uh, the modern era and different advances. Uh, there are also, however, jumps in the middle period. So here I'm showing this time span between around nine, uh, 900 and um, 1400s. And you can see some jumps. Those jumps are a little bit unexpected. Perhaps uh, they are even in, contra in contrast to this claim that uh, we've heard about some decline after the Renaissance of the Abbasid period. There's a claim that there's been a decline in the, um, uh, in the language use, but still there, is some, there are these jumps that perhaps indicate, well, maybe it's not exactly a decline. Uh, so uh, did we verify uh, previous periodizations? Um, there is this claim of uh, pre-standardized classical, classical Arabic and uh, standardized classical Arabic. Uh, when we look at the literature, 
And so we, we see that linguists uh, and historical linguists come up with some features that we say, they say, this is a distinguishing feature. Uh, this is something that is found in pre-standardized classical Arabic, but not in standardized Arabic or the other way around. Uh, it's, it's a little tricky because most of those features are uh, things about uh, pronunciation and uh, vocalization. So we will not see them because we have a written text and this is a definitely a shortcoming of, of, the, of the data set and the work. So we can't really take into account uh, phonological feature things that have to do with how, um, with how words are spoken. Uh, there are a few other features. Uh, so there's a claim that uh, in the early period, uh, abstract nouns used to be denoted with this phrase, which means from the perspective of, and later they've been replaced by a, a special suffix, this ia, which this means something like the ness, the, uh, uh, so emptiness, cowardness, or things like that, or, um, Oops, sorry. Uh, so there is this claim that later, eh, early, we used to have this phrase and later it was replaced by a, a, a certain suffix. Uh, we, it, it's hard for us to provide evidence because there are actually very few instances of this phrase that is said to be very early, but those instances are late. Um, they come in later. Period. So, uh, but because there are so few, uh, I wouldn't, I don't think we can draw very strong conclusions from this. Uh, and there are also certain words that are said to be used. So um, in post-standardized classical Arabic, supposedly we have more uh, use of, uh, of a certain verb, uh, of various verbs like aidan, uh, which means also, or uh, certain adjectives of relations, uh, that that end with uh, the suffix ani. So these are things that appear here if you, if you read them. If not, that's fine. Uh, we've looked at those. Uh, we see the verb uh, aidan, uh, this adverb, uh, sorry, the adverb, but we see it all over the place and even in early texts. So it doesn't really correspond to what we think is a post standardized classical Arabic. Uh, as to these adjectives of the form ani, we see some increase in uh, usage. This is this black line here. It's very noisy. Um, there is some increase, so maybe it indicates a later kind of the language use, although we see it before, even before what, we, uh, what, what uh, the literature says it should uh, appear. So uh, I would say we kind of verify, but not exactly uh, those uh, specific linguistic features. Uh, in conclusion, this work uh, first processed the OpenITI, which is an independently built, or not independently, but it's previously built a large scale corpus of so called Arabic, and our pre processing is also available. Uh, so, all those NLP techniques and the outputs. Uh, we investigated how to periodize Arabic. And we found uh, what is clear is we found this separation of early and modern periods. Uh, uh, from a large middle period or large core. So there's something different going on in the very early time period and the very late time period. In the middle, there's a very large, uh, long uh, middle uh, period. We also saw, found some evidence for the subdivisions that were previously proposed and perhaps a new division that happens in the late 15th uh, century that uh, was not uh, previously described. Um, that's it. Uh, if there are any questions, remaining questions that I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. So interesting. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Please feel free to first. Um, I always have questions. Um, just, I'm, I'm wondering if the linguistic tools are worth training for for classical arabic is it is it something that people think of you know like re, i don't yeah. know if it's even machine learning based but you know. yeah they are um these tools so you refer to all the nlp tools that we applied i think mm -hmm. uh, yeah they are uh based on machine learning uh 
Farasa is mostly machine learning, but it also has a lot of feature engineering and the lemmatization, for example, is rule-based there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a question because in, initially uh, we thought that they, these tools will not work well for classical Arabic. And so that could be a very big shortcoming, but in a small manual evaluation, they seem to be fine. And, uh, you know, we had Alexander, who is a historical linguist and an expert in, in ancient Arabic texts. You know, he read those and to him, uh, the results were pretty good, um, surprisingly good. So I'm not sure it's, if it's worth it or not. I think there is a little bit of work on, um, on Arabic and on classical Arabic NLP, but you know, you end up um, being limited by the availability of annotations or uh, lexicons mm -hmm. and, and so on. And those are very hard to get. So if there are no more questions, Jonathan, it was really, really fascinating. Uh, uh, Frederick, yes? Yeah, I, I, have a, I have a short question. I mean, you pointed out that the, um, sorry, I'm talking to the screen. Um, you pointed out that um, the, the corpus is quite diverse, but there's mostly religious uh, texts, of course, available. Um, and have you um, done uh, such, a, um, such an evaluation just based on one genre? Have you done that also? No. No, we have not. So I, yeah, I guess you could. So, so I mean, yeah, right. Just filter out those. Um, well, to, to, to just ha just have an idea of whether it's genre by genre or it's a general thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I understand. I think that's a good idea. We have there are all sorts of religious texts, but uh, you know, there's hadith and Quran, and uh, there's also a lot of adab there. So yeah. there are different things. We could, fill, we could just focus on one of them and repeat the study and see if the yeah. results are consistent. I think we haven't done that, but that's a good suggestion. Yeah. I mean, let, let me know. Oh, maybe I'll, I'll write you later and maybe you can let me know whenever you, you do some specific uh, analysis. I mean, sure. And the data, the data is there. So it's also possible if you're interested to take it and, um, and do something like that. It's, uh, yeah. I think it's possible. Okay, thank you. Thanks. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Jan, you want to ask? Uh, uh, thank you. I, I don't know how much time we still uh, we still have, but I'll try to be, to be brief. Uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, this is the kind of, it answers a lot of questions I had about the open IT um, corpus and, uh, and how it is used. Uh, I'm not, I'm myself not working on Arabic, but I'm trying to, to do some uh, textual analysis with a Persian text. Um, so so I, I have some of, uh, somehow similar questions. Uh, and. I don't know if you wa will want to continue on this corpus, but one of the things that might uh, point out to the specificity of some texts would be to check whether the Arabic of non-Arabic authors is different. Because, yeah. because you, will, you, you would have a lot of texts that were written by, by people from all, all around. Uh, especially in the um, uh, in, in the modern times, because uh, Arabic was still uh, was of course the main language for uh, um, legal and, and uh, religious texts, both in, in the Safavid Empire and the uh, and the Ottoman Empire, uh, and most of the authors knew Arabic very well. Uh, but still, they might have a different use of it. And, and there is actually some historical texts about it, uh, about, for example, uh, Persian, um, Persian um, scholars trying very hard to write good Arabic and failing. Yeah. Uh, failing to imitate the style. So, so I, I wondered whether you, you had done it uh, and, or whether you would because I, I would be very interesting to hear uh, some more about that. 
uh, and uh, another thing that I was thinking of when you when you had a short comparison between uh, between what you found uh, and the lifespan of words, maybe a more interesting comparison would be with a language that had a status of a language of religion in another cultural context. So maybe the comparison with Latin would be more fruitful yeah. than the comparison with English. Yeah. Uh, for, yeah. for the reason that, at nice. least in, in, in Europe, uh, if someone quotes the Bible, they will quote it in Latin for a very long time. You could also try it in Greek. Uh, yeah. I, I have no knowledge of, uh, of uh, the Hebrew traditions, so I, I will not comment on that, but probably yeah. something could be done. And as to the, um, to the last uh, division uh, in the late 15th century, uh, that would correlate with the time divisions that are being used or pushed forward by at least part of the historical community working on uh, Islamic intellectual history. So there is, there is that idea that the split by the end of the Abbasid Empire is a very important symbolic one, but that it, it is maybe less effective than the split that you actually see in the data in the late 15th century. Because in one of your first charts, we can see that there's actually a huge production when it comes to words, not to the amount of text, but to words, after the Abbasid fall, but before the 15th century. If I remember well, that was one of your first charts. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I yeah. mean, your results just fit perfectly with, with what I know from, from my field. So, yeah, uh, that's great to hear. And if you, if you can share with me, maybe separately, a reference to these results from intellectual history, then that would be great. So, it would be good to relate to that. I could probably send you to someone who knows better because I, it's just something I yeah, heard. From that's you. fine. Uh, as to the first two points, so um, regarding Persian, first, you probably know that OpenITI also has Persian texts, uh, so that's one uh, issue. About non-Arabic speaking authors who write in Arabic, yeah, that's a huge question. You know, from the very early days of Arabic use from Sibawaihi and uh, in early days it was an issue of people who are not, Arab, not Arabs coming in and learning the language and supposedly corrupting the language, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I mean, that's, has been, that has always been an issue with, um, with Arabic. We don't really take this into account, but one could if you had a, um, if you had a characterization of the authors, I, I imagine you would, but that sounds like a pretty big deal. There are many, many authors there. So finding for each of them, their identity Sounds like a, a lot of work. Um, and finally, the comparison to English, I agree, Latin may be a better language, although Latin, and in fact, Latin is often compared to Arabic uh, by um, uh, historical linguists. I heard this comparison before, uh, but Latin has not been a, a, a living active language for as long as Arabic has. I mean, it has re remain more of like a scripture language as far as I know for some many years. So, so well, there's a difficult point there. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that last point because uh, um, as far as I remember also, of course, uh, so uh, Latin has remained a, somehow living or at least spoken language until the 17th century, basically. Uh, until we start working as philo uh, until in Europe uh, philology takes hold, Latin is taught as a spoken language to mm. any person who has uh, an advanced religious education. So of course it's not uh, anyone's native language. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's 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 for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I I wouldn't be so. Well, never mind. Uh, you get my point. But, but I think it's a fair point. It's a fair point and one, one, I mean, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.